Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where we are today. There's people I'm sure from, from all over. I know I've seen people from as far away as India and, um, and people all over Canada and the United States. So welcome. You're, you're so welcome from wherever it is that you're um, joining us from today. And before we um, introduce uh, our guest, uh, I just wanted to introduce the land and somehow today that feels uh, especially appropriate. I'm uh, joining you today, I'm doing some house sitting and I'm visiting in Powell River, also known as Cathet. And uh, Cathet is a name that was given um, by the elders of the Telamon Nation uh, to the peoples all around Powell River. Um, and it means working together. And I just, I just love knowing that that's, that that's what it means. And I'm going to show you a photo. And I'm just going to share my screen. And I'm just going to take one second to get it on the right view. Uh, view. Wait a second. Sorry, it's just taking me a second here. Oh, slideshow. There we go. Okay. So if this is not where you expected to be today on Awakening Spirituality, you can just adjust yourself and go, hey, I found something really cool. <laughs> or, or you can um, uh, make your choices about what you'd like to do. But in terms of um, introducing the land, um, this is a, a photo of, of the land where I grew up uh, in a little town called Telqua. And it means the meeting or the joining of two rivers. And um, when Isabella and I had a visit a little while ago, we talked about um, just really wanting to connect a little bit more vividly with the land when we do our land acknowledgement. So um, I'd really like to acknowledge the Wet'suwet'en people from the communities that I uh, grew up in, and it means people of the lower hills. And um, and it's near Smithers, uh, British Columbia, or Telco, British Columbia. But these little um, lady slippers, to, uh, to me, just really represent the miracle of the land. When I was a small child, which was many years ago, we only had one tiny patch about this big in our backyard. Um, and now, when I go back, almost the whole yard, the whole back acre, is covered with these lady slippers. And I was really taught not to pick them and to respect them for the miracle that they are. And they flourished with that respect. So I'm going to let uh, Isabella introduce uh, her land photo, and then we will um, move into our conversation. And uh, Mary Jean's going to unmute you. A bit. Yes. OK. <laughs> How different these two pictures look. Uh, um, so this is, uh, I'm on the uh, land of the, the unceded uh, ancestral uh, lands of the Squamish, uh, Slavertooth and uh, Musqueam. Uh, um, specifically, uh, um, I've, I have spent a lot of time uh, mostly on what's probably mostly Musqueam lands. For example, I, I work, uh, um, three or four minutes from from uh, Sesmat, which is the the, the uh, Musqueam Middens, which used to be the 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 uh, basically the town center of of uh, a Musqueam life. Uh, um, this picture here is a, a picture of a, a little garden, a, a little park that is that I can see from my window. On on 16th, it's called the Tea Swamp Park. And the Tea Swamp Park uh, um, is called that way because there uh, used to be um, a, a plant called the, the laboratory tea plant uh, um, that, that used to grow there. And um, when you look at uh, the little uh, rocks there, they delineate uh, um, a part of the, the big creek that used to go through all of this part of Vancouver. Uh, it's, it, uh, I don't know what the Musqueam called it, but uh, and later on it was called Brewery Creek because there were a lot of breweries. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's both interesting that, uh, that uh, there's some commemoration of that creek which by the way, uh, um, mostly runs underground now. 
but uh, um, it's also a little sad that this this big powerful creek is now only visible as as this kind of short little co uh, commemoration by a stone uh, without any water. So that's my land acknowledgement, and I'm grateful um, that uh, um, for ten thousand years uh, um, indigenous people have stewarded this land, and I hope uh, we will do a better job at doing that ourselves. Thank you, Isabella. Um, and we're welcome to you too. And just also in terms of um, honoring elders or the wise ones that come before me, I just really wanted to say thank you to Mary Jean and Tina Heathers um, and Susan Scott for um, incubating and supporting uh, this endeavor that we have once, once a month to get together as writers who are really drawn to the meaningful experiences in life, the sacred, um, the religious or the spiritual, whatever terms it is that, that, uh, that make the most sense to you or that you feel comfortable to use. And it's also an opportunity for us to learn together. And as Susan Scott teaches us, Life writing is integrative work and it brings together memory and experience and spiritual life writing invites the whole self in memory, um, experience, fact, feeling, imagination, the profane and the sacred. And we offer these life writing uh, sessions once a month to help you find your authentic voice and to shed whatever fears might um, make you hold your tongue. And so, um, so for today and for tonight, I'm really excited to welcome Isabella. Um, Isabella is probably one of the first people that encouraged me to take my desire to write seriously. And it's interesting that we're going to be speaking about the land tonight because she was the first person to read a, a book that I'm still working on, but about ice jams and about the rivers um, of my North country. And um, she really um, encouraged me to keep trying and to keep finding my voice. And so I really appreciate that about Isabella. Um, and you know, we have other things that we have in common, but really what I'd really like to do is to spend some time, um, Isabella, with us to visit um, around writing, being written by the land. And you had shared earlier um, this uh, poem that you had crafted called uh, Written by the Land. Went up north to be a poet, the cold spring wind writes questions onto my skin. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so do you, do you have a sense of what those questions are? Or are they still being formed? What happens when you hear that read back to you? Um, well, it's interesting because the questions are, feel less important than, than the cold wind <laughs> that um, in a way I'm, it's one of the few things that I'm taking with me from this incredible experience that I had as, as a writer in residence at, at uh, Hay Lake Lodge in Algonquin Park in, in April. Uh, um, the, the wind is part of the land, of course. <clears throat> and, uh, and one of the things that happened for me when I was there within within a few days as I was kind of like walking and writing haiku, which is, it's called ginkgo. And I love doing that. Uh, um, all of a sudden I realized that I not so much wanted to write about the land, but I wanted to, yeah, I want, I wanted to reverse it. <laughs> how, how can the, how can this powerful, powerful land write me? I mean, I'm so, here I am kind of like, walking through this landscape uh, that is so big and so empty of, of people. So the, the next uh, store was 20 minutes away by car. So, so I mean, it was quite uh, secluded. Uh, um, so I'm just kind of like this tiny little human ant. <laughs> uh, um, so so how, how, can I, how can I experience that? Uh, um, both in my body, in my mind, in my writing. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, often when we look forward to experiences like that, and I did have a chance to talk with you before you went away, we had a nice visit, and there were all the things that were exciting that were being looked forward to, but when we think about a residency, especially a writing residency, we think about the craft, and what, what you're introducing to us right now in this moment is that the craft took a different place, that the mm -hmm. land itself. Um, can you share a little bit more about, about how that is that you're, that you're, you're thinking about being written by the land, but, but where does that lead to eventually, perhaps when you get back to writing or does it matter? Like, where are you at with that right now? Um, where am I at with that right now? Right now I'm at digesting that the experience. <laughs> um, at that point when I was there, I really wanted to feel into and experiment what that actually means, like uh, um, in terms of words being produced. So there's, yeah. there's one, uh, um, yeah poem uh, I don't have it like right on me right now but there's there's a, a um a line that says the ditch falls into me <laughs> so you know um I mean you can take that as something funny uh, but I I wanted to say those words to experience so like what does that sound like what does that mean to me uh, um what is that like when when it's not me who falls into the ditch, but the ditch falls into me. If that makes any sense. Well, I think it kind of does because it's, it's you know, to me, what, what I think of when I hear you saying that is this idea of, of becoming one with, um, and this idea that land isn't just passive, like in the ditch, mm -hmm. but, that, that, but that there's this, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to language it, but I think that, that there's this energy that, that attracts us to each other mm -hmm. um and i think what you're talking about a little bit is how do we rest in that place where the land has has entered us mm -hmm. and it sounds like you're resting now but at some point you do want to be thinking about how to also maybe write about that experience and share it um well i mean Yes, I mean, this. I, I definitely, I mean, I, I kept writing. I mean, I didn't stop writing. <laughs> uh, um, and, and, and I wrote poems that uh, uh, um, haiku and a few tanka, like what, what you just read is, is, is a tanka, uh, um, that reflect that. Uh, um, how much of, I don't know, um, how much of that experience needs to be like a sand painting? It's uh, um, it happened and it happened in the moment, and the moment is over. Over, mm -hmm. uh, um, but I mean, obviously, <laughs> we're talking about it right now. Uh, right. Uh, I just don't want. I hope that if and when I write about it. Uh, I will find language that that again is not so much about uh, that is it's a language of intersubjectivity where where the experience and the land and I are all subjects and the experience and the land are not objects that are right about that's that's a pretty big distinction that you're making because often we do we think about writing about writing about our experiences writing about ourself writing about in this case the land or beauty or our surroundings so to take to to take the object relationship away and to replace it with with the subject it's almost like being kin um yes yeah i'm curious isabella and i didn't introduce all your accolades because we had we, we had them when we advertised this session and also they will be put into the chat as well. But I do know that you did a writing residency um, with, with the Japanese uh, 
you're going to correct me on the name, but the Japanese Historical Society or in Vancouver. And I'm wondering, did questions of land come up when you were doing that or differently or? Right. Yeah, so that was, at the, that was at the historic Joikogawa house. Uh, as some of you may uh, know, uh, Joikogawa is uh, um, um, perhaps the first uh, um, um, Asian Canadian woman whose writing was, was uh, taken seriously. Uh, she wrote uh, her famous novel, uh, Obasan, about her family's experience uh, uh, during the internment years uh, in the Second World War. Um, and so the, the house where I stayed was, was her, her childhood home that had been taken away from them. So um, it was, was more a house experience than a land experience. <laughs> uh, uh, but the house itself played an important role and it was beautiful beautiful to sit at um the window of of uh joy kogawa's bedroom when she was a child and look out at the garden at at um a cherry tree uh, about whom the 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 legend goes it's, it's actually not correct but it's a wonderful legend that it was uh, um uh, um planted from a cherry uh, a pit that was carried over in the sleeve of her grandfather's kimono. That is a beautiful story. Yes. And, you know, there's this place where, where story and, and reality are married to make truth, right? Mm -hmm. So there's truth in that story, even if it's not factually representing what happened chronologically kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's how you, that's how you relate to that, that story like to to keep the story as as being kind of important when you when you look out the window and you look at the trees that there's the sense of lineage that there's a yes. sense yeah yes yes, yeah. yes a very strong sense of lineage which which is uh, um totally underscored by by the house itself uh, um uh, um they they kept as many old things as possible there and and so uh, but it I felt reverence for the house, uh, but not, I did not think about the difference, the, the difference between subject, subject and subject, object at that time. Right, that's a new learning from this experience in Algonquin Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to need to think about that some more um, after this conversation because you know I even think about my own experience like showing the lady slippers it's like how they you know the respect for the land um, for me in that lesson of learning that it leads to flourishing is something that I don't know that I had words for that when I was learning that lesson but now at this age you know I'm reflecting about things like that and also really open to seeing things less literally um, through our writing. Um, I know, and I'm probably jumping around a little bit, but I think of so many things when I, when I see you. Um, I know also that you, like, I see you as somebody that gets an idea and then you're not afraid to lead into that idea. You have, you have the courage to really see where that goes. And one of the things that makes me think about that is your starting the Muriel's, Muriel's Poetry Prize. And I wonder if you'd like to share a little bit about that, because it's another aspect of, of how it is that you are an instigator and encourager. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. I, I love talking about that. And I see that uh, one of the people who helped birth that project is here, uh, Rudolf. Uh, um, so, um, so Muriel uh, Marjorie was an, an activist, uh, a poet, uh, an actor, um, all sorts of things, uh, um, who spent a lot of time in the downtown east side and who had encouraged me to kind of like really go for it. I'm going to tell a quick story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so so um, 
there was a, a poetry reading that I think again, like Rudolf had invited me to participate in at the, uh, at the Carnegie Center in the downtown east side of Vancouver. And um, so I kind of like, you know, I prepared a bunch of poems and then I get into the car and it's a Sunday after early afternoon and um, I turn on the radio and there is this, this uh, religious uh, preacher who he just, he really went for it. He, he, he was in full preacher mode uh, uh, with modulated voice and, and huge images and, and passion and everything. Uh, um, and I was just totally transfixed by that. I, I just, and it was, to me, it was poetry. I mean, the content like didn't interest me that much. Uh, um, uh, but the, but the, the, the way he spoke was absolute poetry and it was kind of almost like rap. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but, you know, rap spoken by, by a very state kind of like evangelical Christian. Um, so I, I'm, I'm completely enraptured by that. I arrive at the Carnegie Center. Uh, um, Muriel uh, was one of the people who, who she was backstage. I don't know what she was doing backstage. <laughs> so I arrive and I say, Muriel, I was going to write the, read these poems, but I heard this. I heard this stuff on the on the radio, and and there was this preacher, and I don't want to write my read my poems. I just want to kind of riff <laughs> that way and kind of just see what happens. Uh, um, and she said, "Go for it, go for it," <laughs> and and she was this. And I remember like coming out onto the stage. And she was, she was behind the stage, and she would kind of like went, yeah, yeah, and uh, um, yeah. So that's uh, that's what I did, and and it was a it was a lot of fun. It was a very very important experience. So this woman uh, um, passed away in two thousand nineteen. Yes, and I uh, I happened to be at her memorial, and. Uh, um, it was a beautiful memorial and one of the things that happened there is that someone uh, showed an image of a sun's uh, sunrise and as i showed the image they talked about how muriel uh, who who was dying from cancer said uh, um i'm i'm just gonna continue my journey somewhere else i don't know if you can hear my dog Sorry. I can. It's it's okay. It's part of the journey. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So so somehow, and I had just won a poetry prize the night before, uh, um, and I was I thought like I want to take the money that I got there and start a poetry prize in her name. So that's what we did, and we are now in year four. Wow, that's awesome! What a legacy! And I mean, a little earlier on, we were talking about lineage and legacy mm. and how that can transform not only our, ourselves but but others and so to have have the sunset um rise again and again and again mm. in the poets that you gather and 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 help foster you know what might be even the next stage for them you know being involved with the contest so i can think of a better way as somebody that loves words to be remembered um, yeah, I really honor that you did that and that you do that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you are helping me to recognize something, namely that Muriel is my ancestor. Mm -hmm. One of my ancestors. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, Isabella, we do want to hear a little bit of your writing. Um, okay. Yeah, would you would you honor us with a with a piece or a part of a piece? Yes, uh, um, I'll just read a little bit uh, because I know like one of the things that's really important here is for people to write as well. But I'll just give you a little taste. Uh, um, so this is from my book uh, that's called Isabella's Tea Table, Isabella Morris Tea Table book. It's a collection of poems and each poem has a little story that goes with it. So I'll read the poem first and then the little story that actually harkens back to something that I've said before. 
Marbled waterfalls down over creaky forgotten trees, drops like sand deep into crevices that you or I, city folk, will never know exist. A world, a green world, blue and black and crowned by fractals of foam. That's where he sits, small, far away. And if, just if, he wanted to see us, we would be small and far away. And still, there's something that connects us. We don't know what. So about this poem, uh, this is from a series of poems I wrote on a small four by seven notepad. I began to use these pads when I started my discipline of writing at least one poem a day, no matter what, no matter where or when, no matter how short, no matter how stupid. Since I am not a very disciplined person, I would often notice late at night as I was brushing my teeth that I hadn't written a poem yet. <laughs> so, I got, so I got the idea of putting these little notepads and a pen in the bathroom. And there I'd be leaning against the sink or sitting at the bathtub rim, scribbling a bunch of words with my tired hands, eyes, and brain. After a while, I became intrigued by the particular rhythm and forms these poems would take, dictated by the combination of the shape of the paper, the slightly uncomfortable position, my tiredness, which also often meant I wanted to get it over with as fast as possible. Uh, when I'd start the poem, I'd almost never have any idea what it was going to be. But out of the crevices of my brain, really my brain, my hands, God's pen, the creative commons, who knows? There would always rise some smoke that I could follow and trace on paper. So that's that. Yeah, I I love you. I, lo I love the idea of you leaning in your bathroom like, oh, I forgot to write something. And then, <laughs> you know, those writings ending up coming together into a book. Like, it it's like trusting, it's trusting the art wherever you are with it. And then, then there can be a, a cumulative effect. Absolutely, trusting the art, absolutely, really important. I also brought a few haiku of, uh, um, of um, that's connected with a Hay Lake Lodge and Cottages where I had my residency. Should I yes. read yes. them as well? Yeah, read a couple of those. Yes. Um, yes. And then what I'll do is I'll share the screen with your writing um, okay. uh, practice that we get to do together. And, and then you can introduce that after. So, but give us the poems. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So, so the place of my writing residency was Hay Lake Lodge and Cottages, right by the Algonquin Park. And I left a haiku for each of the dwellings. So here are a few haiku. And in the interest of time, I will only read each haiku once. Usually I read them twice. There's only five of them. Um, clouds bathing in the lake, I see angels. Deeper into the forest to hear the rhizomes whisper. Milk white birch bark, I drink in the morning sun. Morning fog, the sun makes her way through the birch stand. To the lake, to the lake, we rush, the creek and I. That's it. Oh, thank you. And written to, or read together like that, um, it is it, it, it takes the short form into a long form. Um, and it's very delicious. Thank you. <laughs> thank oh. You. So um, as is our practice with this group, we're going to um, uh, have a little time to do some writing. And so uh, Isabella is going to uh, guide us through that. And I'm just going to share my screen so that uh, it's easier for folks to, let me see if I've got, got this right. There we go. Um, for folks to um, participate and relax without worrying about having to pay so much attention to the instructions uh, orally. So yeah, go ahead, Isabella. Okay, um, 
So I'd like you to bring to your imagination a time you spent outside that was really meaningful to you. And in your imagination, walk around, sit or lie down, run, swim, whatever feels good and right for those surroundings. And enjoy it with all your senses, seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting, temperature, your sense of your body. And slowly begin to focus on one or two of those senses and allow your hands to start writing. Write down whatever comes up in whatever form works for you, from a bullet list to a poem to gobbledygook to erudite sentences. And if your hand would rather draw a doodle, just go for it. So we'll take about um, six or seven minutes um, to dip in and to do, to do that writing. And then we'll, we'll um, rejoin to, to talk and conversation. So um, I'm gonna set my little timer and for seven minutes. So enjoy.
about one minute more. So we're going to come back together and I just want to offer, um, before we start to chat, I just want to offer some resources and, and some contact information um, to uh, further explore the beautiful poetry and writings of Isabella. And, um, and this information will be in the chat. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So we can visit together and I'm gonna ask uh, that we stop recording so that uh, people feel um, less self-conscious to participate in, in a bit of um, questions or um, just discussion about what, what come, came up for people. And so um, ask Mary Jean to, to notice the, the hands and, um, and Isabella will help uh, us and respond to to what comes up 